Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we move on to tonight's story, I just wanted to let you know about two quick events, two things. I'm really freaking busy this July, so I don't want to miss any of you guys. On July 19th through the 21st, I'm going to be in Huntsville, Alabama. I'm going to be there for Hamacon, and it's actually like a really nice, like, chill convention. Like, everybody there is super friendly. It's got a really great atmosphere, so I really hope I can see you guys there. And there's a brand new convention that's opening up in Mesquite, Texas. July 27th and the 28th, the Texas Haunters Convention is going to be in Mesquite, Texas at the Hampton Inn and Suites. I'll include both these links in the description down below so you guys can kind of get the hang of it. But if you guys would like to come to either one of these places, they're going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be huge, scary, spooky, fun times all around. Also, you know, it'd be cool if I get a chance to meet some of you guys. That's it. On to tonight's story. Most of my old crew, after leaving the Navy, struggled to get over their longing for the ocean. Such was the case for my submarine captain, Lewis Johnson. He always claimed the sea would be his final resting place, where he truly belonged. And following his honorable discharge, he went straight into hyperbaric pipeline welding. It's a dangerous job, but the only enemy is invisible always stalking each dive, each new mission. A foe that can't be sensed, but with the ability to destroy everything you're in in a split second. Pressure. Maybe I'm cursed, unable to live on land with my own people, but at least I'll die where I belong, he had said. Johnson would be lucky enough to forever be united with his one true love at a sight of a burst pipe. One that took him away. Finally making him one with the deep blue sea. It's funny how the brain operates as everything around you is falling to pieces. Far beyond your own control. Once there is nothing left you can do, the mind turns into a place of safety. Fond memories from a time long since past. For me, those memories belong to my time of service, to my old captain and crew. It wasn't an easy time, but it was filled with purpose, with my problems solely confined to the ocean. When Robert yelled at me to get my ass in gear, I finally snapped back to reality. Doc, come on, we gotta get out of here, he yelled. James returned to the central dome alongside Abby. They had heard the alarms, but hadn't the faintest idea about what had occurred. Get to section A. There's still two transport capsules. Get number 05 ready for departure and wait for me, Robert said. Cap, what are you gonna do? James asked. Jennifer is in lockdown. I'm getting her out. What have the creatures got inside? Abby asked. Robert thought for a moment before handing her a walkie. You don't hear from me in 15. Just leave. The station shook as another hole was torn through one of the sections. My ears popped from the shockwave. I'm coming with you, James said. You're not facing them alone. No. We need you to pilot the transport capsule. If you get hurt, we're stuck down here. It wasn't a valid excuse. They all knew fully well that the submarine was easy enough for any of the crew members to maneuver, but Robert refused to risk any more lives and would use whatever reason he could come up with. Cap, please, it's an order. Get out of here now. They hesitantly agreed and started leaving. I'll join you then. I know nothing about the station or the sub, but I can at least assist you should something happen, I said, knowing he couldn't come up with any excuse to stop me. He reluctantly agreed, and together we headed for the labs in Section C, worrying that Jennifer might be trapped behind the airlock. Or worse. Drowning is a horrible way to die. Once you realize there's no way to reach the surface, that you're trapped in a cold, dark tomb, your throat simply closes up. No matter how hard you try to inhale, your body simply refuses even as the agonizing pain of running out of air overpowers your natural instinct to breathe. You simply refuse to give in to the overwhelming desire. It isn't until the body starts shutting down and the corners of your vision start to darken that you reach the breaking point, and your brain decides to pull something in, regardless of air is present or not. Suddenly ice-cold water flows in through your throat, unstoppably filling your lungs. So desperate for air. It's a clumsy, painful way to go. And by the time water has filled each avalus, 
Most are still conscious, with just enough time to regret their decision to ever enter the ocean. I thought it funny, as we ran toward the airlock, that at least we wouldn't drown. Surely the worms would consume us, or the pressure from a collapsing station would instantly crush us. How did the hull get breached anyway? I asked as we got closer. It's supposed to be impossible, but I'm sure it's those fucking monsters, Robert said. The alarm had stopped alerting us about the hull breach and was now recommending a station-wide evacuation. Warning. Hull integrity severely compromised. All crew report to designated docking stations, it said. How much time do we have? Not enough. As we turned the corner at Section C, we saw Jennifer sitting against the wall on the wrong side of the airlock. It took a moment to realize the horrors of her situation. We saw her legs fused with the flesh of the syncytium. They had started eating away at her lower body, digging their way through her flesh and rapidly replacing her organs with their own meat. Despite it all, she remained conscious. Jen! Robert said. The only word he could muster from the shock of what lay in front of our eyes. She slowly turned her head towards us with her eyes red from the hemorrhaging as worms had consumed her insides. Captain, is that you? She said, weakly, blind from blood filling the inside of her eyes. Uh, I'm here, Jen. I guess the sample wasn't dead after all, she joked. The hoarse voice as she coughed up what could only be a mixture of blood and lung tissue. Maybe tell the doc to double check these things in the future. He's here with me now, Robert explained. So sorry, Jen. I... I I know. There's nothing left to do. I guess this is just a... She coughed up, violently spewing out pieces of her lung and worms. Don't worry, Captain. It's not your fault that a monster from the abyss crawled its way up to destroy... Her voice cracked. I looked over at Robert. He looked horrified, but couldn't take his eyes off her. It really hurts. Please, eject this section. I just want it to be over. Robert nodded, forgetting that she couldn't see him. I went over to the control panel. It was fairly easy to use, especially after having witnessed Henry mess with it before. All I needed was the passcode. I thought it wouldn't be right to let Robert essentially execute her himself. I'll do it, I assured them. Rob? Jennifer said. Yes. Don't let these fuckers get to the surface. Promise me that much. I promise. Her abdomen started bulging out. She screamed in pain as the worm started tearing open her stomach. Captain, the code, I asked. He told me the numbers and I input them without hesitation. Years of watching people suffer a prolonged death, knowing that we could do nothing but pointlessly extend their lives had desensitized me to pulling the plug. Immediately, hatches opened on the walls, and alarms sounded as water started pouring in, but since the hull had already been partially breached, they quickly collapsed in on themselves. Within seconds, Jennifer had died. Let's get out of here, Robert said. We ran back towards the central area we had traversed the entire station to get towards Section A. It was the only remaining escape, but as we got to the offices, we could hear something moving within the walls, knocking their way through the pipes. The pumps! Robert yelled. They're getting in through the fucking pumps! Talos's pumps were ancient machinery compared to the rest of the station. As the dome was inserted, they needed to move tons of water outside against the immense pressure, but after finishing the station, they had been long since forgotten left inside the walls while they installed more permanent solutions. Before we could react, the walls broke open, and the syncytium poured itself through the holes, taking the shape of malformed flesh, extending rapidly against the walls. We were cut off from the escape, with only the office available as temporary refuge from the oncoming swarm of worms and flow of flesh, but our safe haven would quickly become nothing more than another prison to extend our survival. Won't hold him for long, Robert said. What now? Robert went straight for his desk, pulling out a pistol from the top drawer. You brought a gun to the bottom of the ocean? I asked. You didn't? He shot back. Never know when you might have to quell a mutiny. He could tell I wasn't amused. 
They both knew a gun wouldn't slow them down significantly, but any help was welcome. He continued to rummage through the closet in the room, eventually pulling out two unused hazmat suits, just like the one I had used while inspecting Mike. Kept you safe inside the airlock. The worms won't penetrate the suit, right? Robert asked with pleading eyes. Look, they breached the EMP suit. One made out of fucking metal. I don't think these will make a big difference. Might slow them down, but that's it. Oh, that's our best shot. The worms had started to pile up on the door, forming a, forming a contracting mesh, slightly cracking the glass. Now or never, James better have that damn sub ready, Robert said as he got into the suit. He fired a shot. Not at the door, but at the tempered glass wall between it, shattering it to a million cubicle pieces as we jumped through. I stumbled to the ground, a few worms getting onto my hands as I stood back up. Robert pulled them off me and shoved me forward. We sputtered for the entrance to Sector A. We were far faster than the worms, but they had formed a mesh, covering most of the ceiling and dropping down on top of us with each step that we took. Another hole in the wall burst open directly above the airlock towards Section A, causing another slump of meat to land in front of the door. Shit! Robert yelled as he instinctively pulled his weapon and fired at the mass on the floor. It froze in place as the worm disintegrated from the bullet impact, reforming, hastily crawling towards us. I tried to turn and run away, but I didn't react in time. To my surprise, the worms completely ignored my presence and headed straight for Robert, pouring onto him from all directions, pulling him to the ground. He screamed in agony as they formed around his limbs, making him unable to fight back. I hurried towards him and tried to pull them off, but for each worm I removed, a hundred others joined in. Within seconds, they managed to tear a hole in the armpit region of his suit. They immediately wriggled themselves in through the hole. I tried desperately to pull him up, but he shoved me away as he realized there wasn't any hope left for him. Get out of here, Doc, he gurgled as blood started to fill his lungs. I didn't even hesitate, shamefully. I ran for my life, while the Synctium was too distracted by consuming Robert. No matter what I'd done, he was already dead. The hallway narrowed drastically as I once more returned to Section A. I frantically tried to input the code to close the airlock. It took me two attempts with shaky fingers to get the correct code, but within a second... The door sealed, and I was once more separated from the abomination on the other side. I'm so sorry, Robert. I whispered to myself. The central dome finally gave in under pressure. Massive streams of water quickly collapsing the ceiling. The station fell apart, and the central power was annihilated under the flood. Plunged into darkness and silence, I ventured forward towards the docking station. While each section of Talos supposedly had their own backup generator, for some reason it hadn't activated, making it hard to navigate through the narrow labyrinth of hallways. Can anybody hear me? I called, my voice echoing endlessly. I bumped my head as I saw a light appearing in the distance. James came running towards me holding a flashlight. Doc, he's still with us. Thank God, he said, his joy quickly fleeting as he realized I'd come alone. What happened with Jen? The captain? I just shook my head in response. No words can convey what happened in the dome, and their absence proved enough about their unfortunate outcome. No time to worry about that now. We need to get out of here. The capsule's just about ready to leave for the surface. We only need Henry to figure out how to get the, the power back. When he arrived at the docking station, I was relieved by the increase in ceiling height, if only ever so slightly. Henry was busy at work on the control panel, trying to figure out what had cut the power from the backup generator. Abby standing behind him with a flashlight. God damn it, he yelled. Something has torn away the backup generator. Not sure how, but I'm I'm sure I know what. Fucking abyssal demon spawns, he sighed. Between the lack of power and the damaged hull, the sub can't release from the station. Essentially, we're stranded here. None of us spoke a word. Trapped in a tin can 20,000 feet below the surface with no transport. After what felt like an eternity... Henry finally broke the silence. Well, those are all great ideas, but they won't work, he said sarcastically in response to our lack of solutions. Well, then, do you have any idea then, genius? Abby asked. Henry sighed. As a matter of fact, I do. He walked into the capsule and started messing around with the electronics, eventually pulling off one of the panels. There are three batteries powering the sub. The way I see it, I could take one out and should still have enough power to get you all to the surface. Us? James asked. I need to connect this battery to the airlock. He continued as he pulled one of them out of the capsule. And then I'll override the door and it'll... It'll blow up from the pressure and the resulting wave of water should forcefully eject the sub. What about you? 
Well, someone has to stay behind to follow through with the plan. Then let me do it then, James interjected. No, you idiot. One wrong connection, the door fries, locking forever. I'm the only one with the expertise. There has to be another way. There isn't. <sighs> Trust me. James and I looked at one another, both wanting to speak up but never able to come up with an alternative solution. Henry went back into the transport capsule and sealed the panels shut again. Look, I wish you were all smarter. Maybe one of you could have stayed behind, he said, as sarcastically as ever. But for the first time, with the slightest smirk on his face. Thank you, I said. Yeah, well, time for you to go, he said as he shut the door to the capsule. We watched as Henry walked away for the last time, ready to face his fate. An asshole to the bitter end, but one with a kind heart. Like his other perished crewmates, he had forever remained at the ocean basin, never again witnessing sunlight. Time went on forever while we waited for a wave of water that might just as likely crush us in an instant. But with a ton of luck, we'd be ejected out from the station, and from there we could reach the surface. It would be the most violent takeoff in the station's history, but also the last. Minutes later, we heard the sound of the airlock opening before shattering to pieces under the immense pressure of exploding water in the syncoteal flesh. It only took about ten seconds for the wave to hit us, and we shot out of the Talos, the hallway behind us falling apart as we did. It hit us hard and roughed us up a bit, but we survived. James took control of the vessel and didn't hesitate to start ascending towards the surface. Abby and I stared out of the tiny window. On the other side, we could see the utterly crushed remains of Talos, dimly illuminated by the light still powered by the generators at Section C, which had been completely covered by the flesh of the Syncotium. The thousands of corpses of fish that previously littered the ocean floor had been cleaned up and were now part of the ever-growing monster from the abyss. A wave of relief washed over me, with my heart calming down for each foot of our ascension. I no longer felt the need to constantly look out the window. The world outside was dark, and whatever life remained down there had been consumed alongside my longing for the ocean. Once we reached a depth of 5,000 feet in the middle of the midnight zone, we managed to establish contact with the USS Orion. Calling for an emergency evacuation. They were quite the distance away, but by the time we'd reached the surface, they'd pick us up albeit curious as to what had happened in the depths. At 3,000 feet, the first rays of daylight greeted us with the warmth of the sun. The ocean started filling up with peaceful life, fish thriving in the waters, completely ignorant of the horrors that existed directly below them. The vast darkness turned into a calming blue. For the first time since being hired for this mission, I felt safe. Before long, we breached the surface. We were greeted by a team wearing hazmat suits as we boarded the ship. We had been unable to alert them of the situation. All they knew was that a potential contagion existed in the depths. One we could have brought back with us, so understandably they locked us in the sick bay, isolated from the rest of the crew. For 72 hours, they pricked and prodded at us, taking multiple blood samples and even a CSF probe. After they all returned normal and no sign of sickness was apparent, they led us into more comfortable living arrangements as we set for shore. After being released from sickbay, I hardly saw James and Abby. They spent most of their time in their rooms, only coming out for the occasional interrogation. Headquarters were incredibly curious as to how a state-of-the-art installation suddenly collapsed. We had absolutely no proof of the events that had transpired. They needed someone to blame, but as part of the CDC and not the original Talos crew, I was safe from prosecution. All that was required of me was to sign a non-disclosure agreement, one I'm breaking right now, to warn you about the horrors of the abyss. We know more about what exists in our outer space than we do about the life in our own oceans, and that's... that's how it should remain forever. These creatures, the Syncotium, 
can't be killed. As long as one single cell remains, be enough to restart their hives. And I fear that with the consumption of Talos, we may have learned about life on the surface. Now that I'm posting this, I'm heading for the center of disease control. I can feel the worms wriggling inside my chest as I type. Ready to burst out in any moment, I'm guessing the suit. Didn't protect me after all. I hope James and Abby are safe. That they get a second chance at living a happy life. And I'm so sorry for all of this, for what's to come. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and I just wanted to give a big thank you to you for watching tonight's video, or listening to tonight's podcast episode, for uh, clicking on this Mr. Creepypasta story time. Before I wish you sweet dreams tonight, I just wanted to give a big thank you to Taisea Lynn, Gino Baga Arneo, Eric Mary, Daniel Polson, Trey Smiles, Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Wayne Milestead, Ken Lando Higuchi, Brianna Ventine Jensen, Nicholas Saeed Alyasin, Buddy Burroughs, Tyler Ramberg, Goonington, G Weevil 3, Diana Krauss, Asia, Gabrielle DeBaca, The Red Oak Shield Virus, Sandy Barney, Melissa Swagart, Chempinski, Daniel Rao, The Ginger Bros, Robert Ramirez, Andrew Stenberg, Holy Realm, Ralph Rodriguez, and Dr. Strawberry. These guys are the friggin' amazing people from Patreon who help me stay alive. If you guys would like to help support the show as well, you can always check me out at patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta and get your name either shown here at the end of the credits or in the description down below. And you can check out this podcast here on YouTube or here on Spotify or Apple iTunes podcast or Google Play podcast, whichever one you happen to go to. I mean, seriously, if you're on YouTube right now and you look down in the description, there's like a whole list of different playlists that you can be able to watch, like hours upon hours upon hours of content. If you want to get your horror story creepypasta fix, it's, it's all there as well as like a live stream. Oh, and also my wife sells Dungeons and Dragons themed tea. Etsy.com slash Ivory Monocle Tea. <laughs> Links are also down below. <laughs> Sweet dreams, everybody.